George Kirkpatrick, inspiration for the nation, celebrating people we feel good about. So if you go to the Winter Fair today, um, you will have an opportunity to meet a piece of Syracuse University sports history, the legacy of one other than our very own Greg Allen, honored by the university uh, for for outstanding contributions. We'll get into that in, in just a moment. But one of the things that he and a group of his fellow players did is they protested and boycotted because of discriminatory practices within the football program. They had some demands. Those demands weren't met. And so they took actions into their own hands. Known as the Syracuse 8 documentary um, um, made about them. And, and Greg, I've never met you before, so I'm really yeah. honored uh, to meet you. And I'm really um, happy Likewise, to George. That, yeah, and I'm happy to have this opportunity for our audience to hear your story uh, from the very beginning uh, as as you uh, were at Syracuse University doing a very critical time that led to uh, some amazing things that we'll get to as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess if I really want to kind of frame the story, um, uh, originally I'm from New Jersey. And uh, like most young men uh, who were playing football um, in the night in the late '60s, early '70s, uh, Jim Brown was your hero. I was a yeah. running back in high school, and uh, Jim Brown went to Syracuse. Uh, he was the greatest running back, greatest athlete probably ever, and uh, he was one of my idols. And so when I got the opportunity to get a scholarship to Syracuse, um, I was all in. Uh, I assumed that since there had been so many great black athletes like Jim Brown and Ernie Davis and Floyd Little and John Mackey and, and it goes on and on, um, that it was a great place for African-American athletes to uh, matriculate, get a, get a good education and also have uh, an opportunity to fulfill a childhood dream of playing in the NFL. And uh, uh, all those things were, were possible um, but as we know, um, there was some uh, racial discrimination in which the university termed as institutional racism that we had to deal with. Uh, to kind of frame it for your uh, for the viewers, um, <clears throat> imagine this. Um, my first day on campus, I arrive um, at the airport. I'm picked up by my coach on our way to uh, my dormitory. Uh, he tells me that he's so glad I decided to come to Syracuse, that uh, too bad freshman can't play. He thinks I can make a contribution right away. Uh, hope that I have a great uh, experience at Syracuse and get a good education. But while I'm here, don't date any white girls. Oh. Um, and so that was within the first uh, 10 to 15 minutes of my arrival in Syracuse. Um, I kind of brushed it off because that wasn't my intent. You know, to come to Syracuse. <laughs> right. Uh, and so when I uh, uh, got to campus and met some of the other uh, ball players, I had mentioned that conversation and they chuckled and said they had the same conversation. Um, so that was the beginning of me trying to understand that, well, I, I know I had, you know, uh, at least I thought I had gone the opposite way of the uh, Mason Dixon line. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, it was here. Uh, the other incident, I think that, um, motivated me to to boycott uh, was a conversation I had with our head coach. Um, during this period, we're talking 1969, 1970, uh, across America, there were uh, campuses that were engaging in black studies. Uh, one was Cornell, right up the road. Right up the road, and, right. Uh, they, yeah, didn't and, they, they, I don't know, was that the year that they took the building over or was that a little bit and, later? Uh, it, it was it was right after that. I think they, they took it over. And then following that, that's when they got the Black Studies program. Mm -hmm. And then the following that, I think that following spring, we were trying to get it at Syracuse. And so um, a couple student athletes, a couple of uh, af students came to me and said that they'd like to have a student athlete accompany them when they talk to the dean of men about putting a Black Studies program on campus. Um, I thought it was a great idea. I decided to to join them. I was a participant, but I wasn't uh, a leader in the meeting. 
a um, couple of days after the meeting, I got a call from the football office saying that the head coach would like to speak to me. Um, I assumed maybe that it was about spring practice since uh, it was uh, uh, February or so. And, and I thought that maybe he wanted to see, make sure I was in shape and ready to go come spring. Um, when I got to his office, uh, we sat down and uh, I, I just remember this scene vividly. He, he peered over his glasses at me and said, uh, what's this I hear about you and this black crap? Oh. And uh, I, you know, as you might think, I a little stunned, a little, you know, and, and I said, coach, I'm not sure what you mean. He said, what's that this year? What's that I hear about you and this black crap? And I said, oh, are you talking about the black studies program? And I told him, I said, yes, I went up and I was a participant, but um, yeah, I thought it was a good idea. And so they needed a, or at least they wanted some diversity in the group. And they asked for, you know, a couple of student athletes and uh, they asked me and I said, I would do it. And uh, he said, all right, well, you got a decision to make. Do you want to be black or do you want to be a football player? Oh. And, you know, for me, uh, at 19 years old, um, that was uh, a defining moment for me because even in those few seconds, I knew that we were talking about my humanity, you know, that you didn't see me as a black man who played football, but you saw me as a football player who happened to be black. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I decided then that uh, uh, there had been some other instances and we had been talking amongst ourselves and, um, and shortly thereafter, we, we decided that we were going to boycott. Now, um, each, each of us had our own experience of why we were led to, to boycott. Uh, but those were uh, two of the tipping points for me. And so when you say you were led to boycott, what did you specifically, what were you deciding that, that we weren't going to play that you, because deciding to boycott also, wouldn't that also put your scholarships in jeopardy as well? Um, yes and no. Okay. Um, the, the decision to boycott um, uh, came about by, of course, the era that we were in. Sure. Um, you know, Martin Luther King and, and civil rights and marching and boycotting the Montgomery bus bo boycott, et cetera. And so we were trying to think of something that would get um, attention, someone's attention, or the university's attention, since the coach didn't seem to be paying attention to us. And... Um, and this is Coach uh, Schwarzwalder? Yes, yes, mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. And so for us, um, of the eight of us who initially boycotted, uh, five of us were starters. Mm. And so we thought that, of course, that would have an immediate impact and uh, we would get, you know, the attention that uh, we we thought that we deserved and the issues that deserved. And um, uh, so after, you know, uh, I guess, consulting and mulling it over with one another, uh, we decided that we were, we were going to boycott and, uh, you know, not attend spring practice. Um, again, under the hope that once uh, um, uh, they realized that our demands weren't anything out of the ordinary. I mean, what we asked for was um, expert medical attention, um, a little known fact that the doctor at the time was a gynecologist. Our team doctor for the football team was a gynecologist uh, by practice and trade and training. Uh, we asked for better academic counseling. Uh, the reason being that most of us uh, didn't have an academic counselor, but our coaches, they were making decisions about our classes and, and our, our minors and majors. Um, we also wanted that uh, to make sure that positions were assigned based on merit and not color. Um, at the time, uh, you're, you're talking the late 60s, um, uh, you know, black players didn't play quarterback, center, or middle linebacker. Mm. Those are supposedly the thinking positions, and and we were excluded. Um, and uh, the other thing is that we wanted to uh, uh, the school to hire a black coach. Uh, we wanted a uh, you know an integrated and diverse coaching staff. We wanted someone that uh, um, we could uh, um, air our grievances with, you know, an advocate. And so the, so the idea wasn't to change football or stop football at Syracuse. 
it was that we wanted uh, the same opportunities as everybody else, and we wanted to make Syracuse a better place. And and that was our goal. And so it was eight of you. Oh, how come I see nine sometimes? Okay. Um, the Syracuse eight, there were eight football players who boycotted. There were eight scholarship athletes who boycotted. Uh, the There's a gentleman who had been uh, suspended from the team uh, in 1968 who we were friends with, you know, was one of our friends, and he decided to join us. And so then that became uh, the ninth. He was like an honorary member. Okay. But we're called we're called the Syracuse Eight because there were eight scholarship athletes who boycotted. And then, you know, well, at a later date, uh, another ball player decided to join us. Uh, you... you mentioned the scholarship. I, I skipped over that. I want to go back to that. Yeah. Uh, during that time period, when you got a scholarship to any university, you signed a four-year um, commitment. And so when the university um, threatened um, our scholarships, we found out from a, a Syracuse alum and also actually a, a faculty member at, at Maxwell uh, told us that because of the contract we had signed, we had a four-year scholarship. And unless, and there wasn't anything in there for um, uh a skipping practice, you know, in, in that sense, you know, the, you could lose your scholarship for, you know, uh, uh, you know, doing something like getting arrested or, you know, something, right. something crazy like that. But they but, did threaten you with that. Yes. They, we were threatened with that. Yeah. Um, and, and that was a major concern. I mean, uh, you, you know, most of us were, uh, uh, first year, um, uh, first generation, college students, you know, uh, our parents hadn't gone to college. And so um, we weren't just attending college for ourselves. We were also attending it, you know, for our parents and and, and that legacy. So um, it was a major, major concern uh, that we would lose our scholarships. But at the time, we thought that we had to put them at risk because of what was at stake. And was it true that, uh, the, I, I guess, the last straw that there was a, uh, did I read somewhere that, Floyd, you asked Floyd Little to to be uh, either a consultant or something, some relationship, and that commitment was not upheld. Yes, um, as as a condition um, uh, of us practicing before we before we boycotted, uh, Floyd Little was going to. We were told that Floyd Little was going to be the our coach for spring ball. Uh, we assumed that Floyd was going to be here the entire spring practice. Uh, Floyd was only here for a couple, three days. And we found out that the reason he was really in town was to get his taxes done. <laughs> and so we felt that we were deceived. And that's when actually we we boycotted right after that. So how long did you boycott and when did it get resolved and how did it get resolved? Um, we 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 missed the entire season. The entire season. Yeah, the entire season of 1970. And and I and I and, and let me frame it this way, George, the, the importance of that. Um it wasn't just a missed season. Uh it was missed opportunities in life. Um as, as I said, uh, five of us were starters. And uh if you go back and look at uh history in Syracuse, and specifically black athletes. If you were a two-year starter uh, at Syracuse, you had a 90% chance of being drafted in the NFL by the third or fourth round. Mm. And um, we knew that, at least the five of us knew that, and that we were putting it all on the line. Uh, but again, we were also naive enough to think that once we were exonerated, that we would be forgiven and uh, you know we could go on with our our careers that we wouldn't we wouldn't be blackballed, uh, but we were eventually we were blackballed from the NFL. So none of you got to play in the NFL. No, none of us none of us got to play in the NFL, um, uh, or or the CFL. Mm. We, we were we were we were blackballed. When so you didn't you didn't end up playing. So how did they how did the protests end and when did they did they re, they reinstated you to the team? Okay. Um, actually, you know, during the boycott, um, I was offered, uh, to come back 
Mm-hmm. Um, I was the only one that they offered to come back on the team. And you were still in school, obviously. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes, yes. So, uh, uh, but I didn't go back. I told them that if um, uh, I wanted to come back, I was willing to come back, but only if they would let the others come back on the team as well. Mm-hmm. Since we all had committed the same offense, if uh, they could find it to forgive me, then they should forgive the others as well. And um, They decided they didn't want to do that, so I didn't go back myself. Um, I did go back to play uh, my senior year, and um, I did play my senior year at Syracuse. But again, um, after the season, uh, it was obvious to me that I wasn't um, going to play professional football. And so um, did, when did you see the changes start to occur as a result of your boycotting? So you're, so, so, and were there other, you were the nine starters, eight starters who boycotted. Were there other black folk on the team that continued to play? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. There, were, there were two gentlemen who decided that um, uh, they didn't want to boycott. And I think, I think that's important, too, and I'm glad you brought that up, George. Um, there was no pressure on them either. Uh, the two gentlemen who decided to play, uh, I'm still friends with today, and, and we still talk. Um, but we just felt that everybody had to make an individual decision. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, they wanted to play, and we said okay, and, and, and we, all, we all moved on. Um, I think the, the – I think the commission report that was released in December, November, December of 1970, which stated that institutional racism did exist in the football program and at Syracuse University, and it was unbecoming of a university of Syracuse's stature. Uh, that was vindication for us. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the, the vindication uh, came about by uh, the university admitting that there was institutional racism and not just us professing it or saying it. And so um, I would say immediately after that, the university decided to uh, make some changes and uh, uh, but everything happens gradually, as you know. I mean, uh, I, I sometimes use the metaphor about um, our experience, and uh, I think about, or, or think about, think of it this way: uh, think of eight young men with no maritime experience in a rowboat trying to get an ocean liner to change course. Mm. Mm. You may be successful getting the ocean liner to change course. But because of your lack of maritime experience and knowledge, you don't realize that the wake can be just as devastating as a collision with the with the ship. And so uh, that's something that we all had to to deal with. Uh, we thought that once you know uh, the report came out that we'd be vindicated and you know everything would would go back to normal. But that wasn't the case at all. But in two thousand and six. You received the Chancellor's Medal yes. of Extraordinary Courage. And in 2009, you received the Varsity Club Letterman of Distinction. Yes. Did that feel like exoneration as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and I'll, I'll give Syracuse credit, um, and especially in, t- in today's world where people are running from their history and running mm. from their past and, you know, trying to uh, modify it any way they can. Um, Syracuse, um, you know, went straight forward, you know, and said, yes, we were wrong, you know, and uh, we want to apologize. And that was a big moment for, you know, uh, Nancy Cantor uh, uh, to, to apologize to the Syracuse 8. It, it was very important to us. And uh, uh, Letterman of Distinction um, and the mural that we have now, um, there are, uh, there's a Syracuse 8 scholarship, there's a Syracuse 8 Courage Award. Uh, and so uh, we've been honored over, over time. And, and uh, I, I think that's the, the, the other piece of our story. Um, I, I think, yes, it would have been great to play in the NFL, but 
in the NFL, you're only one whack away from you know, your, uh, being a career ender, you know? And uh, I, I can't think of, if I were to ask someone, you know, name me 15 players uh, from the Chicago Bear team from 1970, you know, they could probably remember four or five. Um, but now for the Syracuse 8, we're part of Syracuse history. And if you ask me uh, right now, would I rather be one of the Syracuse eight or uh, uh, or a former member of the NFL? I would say I'd rather be one of the Syracuse eight. Because you stood up to institutional racism and were vindicated and validated of the concerns that you raised. And oftentimes people don't get to have that even in their own lifetime. Right, right. And that's special, you know, and again, when I, when I go up on campus, and I, and I see the athletic department and the diversity in the coaching staff, the diversity on the, in team sports, the diversity on the on the on the campus itself. <clears throat> when we were at Syracuse, um, the minority population was two percent. It's now thirty two percent or something like that. And again, I mean, we we look at that and and can say that you know we 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 helped reshape Syracuse. Um, I sometimes talk about the fact that uh, Syracuse in 1870 uh, was a university uh, whose charter and, and pillar said that there would be no invidious discrimination here. And a uh, hundred years later, it took eight young student athletes, black student athletes to echo that and amplify that in a boycott so that the school would be, would realize and still be and become the institution that it set out to be. And so when I see Syracuse today, I see efforts of the Syracuse aid. I, I see the boycott. Mm. You uh, graduated in 73 from Newhouse. And, yeah. and now in your lifetime, you have gotten to see Syracuse University do what you may have thought to be unthinkable even that then is the first black head coach, Dino Babers, who now is uh, going on to um, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And now we have uh, Fran Brown, uh, mm -hmm. who came from, was it Georgia? Yeah, Georgia, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who is now the head coach. Um, so what does that say to you about Syracuse? Um, it, it says to me that um, uh, uh, Syracuse is, has arrived. I mean, I can't think of another major program institution that's had two black head coaches back to back. I mean, that tells me it's almost unheard of when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, that tells me that that the school looked beyond that. Um, that they were looking for the right person to do the job and they were more interested in what was in the best interest of Syracuse than what was in the best interest of some who might have looked to uh, Syracuse to go in a different direction. Um, Greg, I'm proud, man. I'm proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and Syracuse has, has done right by you. And like you said, rarely do you get the opportunity to receive an apology and 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 thank God for Nancy Kanner being here at that time, right? right. Because it might not have happened. Right, right. Uh, uh, there, right. There, there, there was no doubt in my mind that Nancy Cantor um, was the catalyst for all this. That. You know, Can and uh, uh, Daryl Gross. Um, Hold on a second, Greg. Also, something uh, is going on here. Let me just. Yeah. I'll just keep let me going. Just pause this real quick. It, it wouldn't have happened without Nancy Cantor. Uh, Nancy Cantor, um, I, I think, is one of the, the strongest people in the world. Um, it wasn't something that Syracuse University um, immediately embraced. <laughs> and uh, uh, But she was uh, 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 stalwart with it and, and wanted to move forward. And and again, I also have to give uh, Daryl Gross credit too. Yeah, uh, Daryl also, uh, um, you know, 
decided to support you know nancy and, and support us us in that so and when you think about it african-american athletic director right. At, right. at syracuse right so yep. yeah 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 and 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 i i also am going to uh give uh chancellor severu um uh, uh, credit too um since he's been there uh, he's made sure um that the you know syracuse aid haven't been forgotten and uh, I, I think that mural is is a testament to that. That's in the uh, JMA dome. Well, Greg, I mean, thank you, right? As an alum of Syracuse <laughs> University, um, and having an opportunity to learn about your legacy and to learn about your story and the contribu com contribution that you made and the change, right? That right, right. because of your right. efforts. Uh, is lasting here at uh, Syracuse University. So if you want to see Greg, uh, go to Winter Fair yeah. today. <laughs> Winter Fair uh, continues today till 6 o'clock at the um, Exposition Center at the Great New York State Fair, nysfair.com. Uh, ticket $7 at the door, $5 in advance. You still have time uh, to mm -hmm. get over there because uh, – uh, it'll be a great opportunity and you get to meet Greg. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that uh, we had to had a chance to connect and shout out Steve um, Becker for making this happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, George. My pleasure. And, we'll and, have to and do it again sometime. We do. And Greg, is there anything that we didn't get to say that you want to make sure that we understand, especially during Black History Month? Um. I think that if if uh, I were to think about anything, I think I would maybe pay a tribute to Jim Brown. Mm. Um, I think Jim Brown was the uh, the beginning, especially in in sports, um, for black athletes at Syracuse. And um, uh, Jim Jim paid a price, and and so yeah, I'd like to give him credit and may may he rest in peace. Jim Brown, Greg Allen, thank you for the legacy uh, and the Syracuse 8 and, and all of the other brothers who stood up and said, uh-uh, we can't have this. <laughs> and uh, you're somebody we feel good about here uh, in Space for the Nation. By the way, Greg went on to a distinguished career in insurance and did some other great things as well. Even though uh, we would have loved to have seen you in the NFL, you said <laughs> yourself, I'd rather have done this that have done that, which is yes. stand up uh, against racism institutionally and in communities. So we thank you for what you've done and your legacy continues. Thank you, George, I appreciate it. Inspiration for the nation. <laughs>